Fission fusion is like the speed bag. Like you can just throw it out of rhythm a little bit. Most people don't push hard enough to really get to that level of overtraining. If you keep going back and thinking that you're broken, that almost turns into an enabling. My training is actually training and not a workout. We need energy to relax. Hey, what's up guys? Thank you for joining me and welcome to the show. It is a true blessing to be able to connect with the top minds and strength each and every week and share stories, insights, and experiences on becoming stronger in every area of our lives. And now I wanna do more for you. I wanna invite you to join the exclusive private Facebook group of The Strength Connection. In this group, I share the biggest takeaways and lessons from these amazing conversations, as well as training and strength tips for pursuing mastery and fulfillment in life. This group is filled with individuals looking to take full control over their strength in their lives, and it's the perfect space to explore ideas and share your journey. You'll also get exclusive access to the Strength Connection Mastery Seminars. It's a deep dive into physical, mental, and spiritual training that you can begin using immediately. Just go to the Facebook groups, type in the Strength Connection, and you'll be accepted immediately. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll catch you on the inside. Welcome back, everybody. Craig, so good to see you, man. It's been too long. How you been? I'm doing great. I, I completely agree. It has been too long. I love doing these. I love your show. I love listening, so I feel like I've been part of it, but I, I'm um, glad to be back. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you taking the time. I always, honestly, personally, I always learn so much from you from these conversations, and I got a lot of people reach out about the talk of fission and fusion that we did last time. I think it was like our third time that we talked about yeah. this specific topic, but because uh, it is very in depth, but it is, it really uh, is a fascinating subject of the work that you were doing with that. And it was, it got a lot of great feedback. So I really appreciate you, you know, coming on and, uh, and diving into that. So last time we finished mm -hmm. though, I remember you had a big milestone birthday that was coming up with some specific goals. Hey, I forget exactly what were the, what were the milestones that you were going after? What was it again? Yeah, no, I, um, so I, yeah, the ones that I've accomplished so far is uh, 25 pull-ups. That one was uh, relatively in my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. um, the weighted pull-up with uh, 48 kilograms, but I, I've, I've upped that a little bit. So that one I made, um, I did a 5K run under 25 minutes. That one's just a random mm -hmm. type thing, but I wanted a little longer endurance. Um, deadlift. 2.5 times body weight, mm -hmm. um, some of the like strong first type goals. And I think we'll get into like some of those strong sure. uh, SFL type things that we talk later. Um, but yeah, some, and then pressing some of those like a um, double body or half body weight press, not double body weight press, but half body weight press. Um, so I've done those. The one I'm still working on is the dunking and okay. um, just some different strategies I've been kind of putting in place now. I was doing a lot of kettlebell swings, but um, paying attention to the knees over toes, toes guy and kind of look, looking at what they do. Yeah. Um, the reverse sled work is amazing. I don't know if you, have you tried that? No, but we, we talked about that last time Did on, we? Uh, okay. on the podcast. Uh, Ben's stuff is very interesting. I've I had a chance to speak with uh, Keegan Smith before, and I had Graham Tuttle uh, recently on who has done a lot of work with with Ben, who does the barefoot sprinting type work, and they promoted the ATG program. And, you know, it was, I think it was one of those things for a while that was still very new. And anything that's new is kind of, you know, there's a lot of skeptics right away out there, yes. but he is, he's doing some interesting work. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a, it, for me, the um, reverse sled is great warm up. Like I feel it in my glutes and my hamstrings. Um, everything just feels like activated. And then from there, like I can, you know, it, it just, everything just feels better. So I, I'm using it as more of a warm up now, but I like it a lot. I, and I think you suggested it to me. So I apologize. I didn't cite you on that, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. What's, what was the feeling that you felt that was so different from the, the backward sled work? Um, uh, just it, like you get a little bit of that lactic acid piece to it. Um, and the way I've set mine up, um, I do backwards and then I go forward with it. Um, it's just, my slide yeah. doesn't turn around very well. So mm -hmm. I am getting like a forward push into it too. So it's like that, that shift, I have just enough rest and switching between the, the muscle groups, but, um, yeah, I love how active my glutes are with it. it. It just really feels like it's, uh, you know, activating different parts of the glutes and like, you, you know, kettlebell swing, you're 
hitting the glutes at the bottom um, of your, your sort of swing position, this you're kind of pulling back. And so it's, it's just kind of activating this, maybe a slightly different angle and different spot too. So. Yeah, I know. I've, I've heard uh, Ben Patrick talk deeply about it and for, I don't have a sled. So, but I believe even just walking backwards for a period of time does a very similar benefit. And I have a trail down the road from my place and like the last quarter mile of it, is like right after this bridge, it was always my time. I would just turn around and just walk backwards. And I think I ran into a couple of people before that probably looked at me with some, <laughs> some cross eyes being like, what the heck is this guy doing? But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's great. Okay. So I was going to say, I mean, dunking, he's, that's kind of the big stuff that he's doing. So I think if you keep following that track, that yeah. definitely be there for that. So the pull-ups though, between the, the high rep pull-ups of over 25, which you said is more in your wheelhouse, was that easier than doing the the heavy weighted pull up for more of like single rep they're both pretty like i i think with my body weight um like that's it's what i mean by it's in my wheelhouse like my strength uh ratio to my body weight for pull-ups is just where it's at you know i'm i'm not a you know my squats are good relative to body weight but like i'm not a like the best person doing squats or, you know, bench press or other things. So like, that's, that's why I mean, but we're relatively easy. Um, and you lose a couple of pounds and it just adds, like, you just feel like, um, you've got turbo boost somehow, you know, you've just let tip yeah. a few pounds off the, the load. So yeah, mm -hmm. it worked out pretty well. It, it's funny. Just even a, a couple of pounds, just off your joints, all of a sudden pull-ups, you feel like, oh, wow, I just progressed by 10% overnight. It's freaking crazy yes. that that gymnastic stuff. Well, it's funny because I did um, at the beginning of the year, I trained for the SFL that I just came back from in April it was an incredible experience. I'm sure we'll talk about that as we get going. But when you get under the barbell quite a bit, it's uh, it's a different feeling on the body. You feel very you feel very tight. You feel very constricted and strong. But mm -hmm. that gymnastics based feel of kind of high rep based work does kind of drift off. Uh, you know, it's got a little bit of a you know, a, a sacrifice for a short period of yeah. time. So it was fun to get back into a little bit of more body weight based stuff after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so bet, are you still, bet, yeah. are you still doing the, the fission fusion? Are you still doing that to, as far as just kind of regular programming? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I've, um, and kind of settled on every other day, um, mm -hmm. sort of, uh, you know, and I, like we talked about that, that pendulum model and, um, you know, I've been trying to work on that analogy a little bit, but like if you, you know, if you're at the swing set and, um, you know, you're, you're pushing it, you can get a nice rhythm, but like a, a speed bag, you know, you kind of get the rhythm and you get faster and faster at a mm -hmm. speed bag. I feel like fission fusion is like the speed bag. Like you can just throw it out of rhythm a little bit and, you know, like you've got to get that right sync. And I'm still trying to work on that piece, but you mm -hmm. know, I'm, I'm, generally fasting a bit before my high intensity repeat type training. And then, you know, on, on weight training days, I'm, you know, feeding the system a little bit, having some, you know, uh, mm -hmm. amino acids afterwards and those type of yeah. things to activate more of the, um, the growth factors. Yeah. Yeah. I got to tell you, after we spoke last time, and that was one of the things you said, and, you know, listeners, if you want to go back and get deep into the fission fusion training, you can go back and listen to that episode we did, Craig did a beautiful explanation of exactly what this is. But one of the things that you talked about was on those fission days of not having to like ingest food right away after training, you can go into a little bit more fasting. And that for me, just in an old mindset, like you got to get that protein in right away afterwards. It's like, you have that, you have that window. We have this visual of this window that's just closing, <laughs> you know, after yeah. 30 minutes. And then <laughs> everything that you just did for your workout just means absolute shit. If you didn't get this, protein. <laughs> I got to tell you, I, afterwards, I, I would get, I got a little bit of like an amino acid drink and just did a little bit more fast. I felt just way better cognitively in my day mm -hmm. when I was doing more of my ballistic based training. And I had another client who brought that specific thing up, who was in that kind of old mindset of like, what are you talking, you got to get the protein. It's like, well, <laughs> give it a, give it a shot of like, this is what Craig mm -hmm. said. So that was a huge insight for me after we chatted last time. That's great. Yeah. I think we've all been in the same place where like my window is closing. I need to get to my protein shake. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So when you talk about like the speed bag analogy, like getting off of rhythm, is that, are you talking about that of like certain day, like certain amount of days of fission versus fusion, kind of finding the right recipe of training volume? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, the, the right recipe. And then also like sometimes, 
you know, I, I get in this mindset and I'm sure many people do, but more is better. So, you know, if I know I'm on a, a fusion day and, you know, I'm, I'm doing my weight training and eating, like, I don't need to do my heat exposure, my cold exposures on that day. I'll wait till my fission day. And like, that's where I feel like I might be trying to do everything all the time. And that's where I, my rhythm just gets off. I just need to, you know, this is for t- tomorrow's, you know, um, fission day. And um, this is for today's you know, fusion day. Gotcha. So it's not about like doing more volume and training, but more stacking the other things like heat or cold exposure on those days. That's an interesting thing. We think a lot about like overtraining of just what you're doing in the workout. But if you're the other things that you're doing, maybe meditation or cold shock or heat shock, if you keep stacking all of them together on that, Mm -hmm. that seems like it could be a form of overtraining as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 um, I I was talking to to, um, somebody else from the the primal endurance group and, and um, we were just talking about is overtraining a, an issue? And I probably would say for most people, it's not. Mm-hmm. But I, I think for your listeners and, and you know, us, um, you know, we have to start thinking about it. Are we recovering enough to keep up this sort of load? And, and you've been, you know, part of Strong First for so long that that idea that you always need to be ready to go. I'm thinking of like, can I put in my best performance tomorrow? I don't want to put in, you know, there's no reason to do a fission day where it's like, half, you know, uh, not worth the effort. So mm-hmm. I, I'm recovering, but also performing, not at peak, but at, at a really, you know, 85, 90% of where I should be almost every day. And that's, mm-hmm. that's what I think is important. So it's not necessarily getting into overtraining. It's just when I'm doing my heavy bag work, am I, what is my power at? Is it where 85%, 90% range that I want to be? Um, you know, when I'm doing my swings, is where's my power at? And so that's what I'm talking about. Not necessarily like I'm so fatigued that I'm overtraining, but just can keep up peak power. And then my training is actually training and not a workout. Um, that's, right. that's what I'm kind of thinking about. It is the the term overtraining is it's one of those beautiful subjects that we we all talk about and it, I it, I was in this mode for a while of just everything I looked at on like social media was talking about a different recovery method and mm-hmm. I'm like two quotes came to my mind I think one was from Pavel where you don't need easy and recovery days if you don't have hard days mm-hmm. and it's like which is a beautiful line just so succinct right there but the other one was from Brett that I heard recently and he said the best training program is one that you don't need to recover from. <laughs> so it's kind, of a com- yeah. it's kind of like a combination of both those together. And I, I thought that for a while of, you know, am I overtraining? Because maybe like your power feels off. But I was also in a, in a mode of a lot of intuitive-based training where I was never really pushing the threshold of it. It's like, maybe I'm just doing too much. Maybe I'm not overtraining. It's just, I maybe just cut the volume down and push it one day, have a little bit more harder day. Then you can make the easier days you know, in mm-hmm. there. But I think a lot of, yeah, it does seem like a lot of times, like most people don't push hard enough to really get to that level of overtraining. If you are getting there mm-hmm. yet, yeah, we can talk about that. But it's like, I don't think you need a million different recovery methods and, you know, ice baths, if you're, you know, just doing a 20 minute, you know, session. Agreed. Yes. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So do you think with, I mean, some of that we talked about last time where we just got into it and then kind of cut off was more on the psychological side of training. And one of the things that you mentioned as we were kind of preparing for this was that right dose of psychological stress that we have. I think that's that's such an interesting phrase to use because stress, it, it has this connotation that it's negative, like we don't want any stress in our life. Mm-hmm. But a certain amount of stress in the right dose, like that is where we grow, you know, could be physically, but it's also psychologically. So could you talk a little bit about kind of that right dose of psychological stress and how we can really apply that? Yeah, yeah, I, I think, um, let me start with maybe some some research and kind of just some things that we think about. So uh, George Bonanno, he does a lot with uh, looking at what happens to people after trauma. And so a traumatic event happens, and then looks at you know how people recover and these trajectories of recovery. Um, just a quick caveat, like I'm not talking about repeated trauma or childhood trauma that's happened you know multiple times. I think that's a whole different type of, of situation. This is uh, you know experiencing something traumatic like a car accident or something happens okay. in our life. Something something quick that changes everything. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And he's looked at sort of these like national type events like a. a 
2001, um, 9-11, you know, and, and charted where people are and, you know, how much they were exposed to these different events. And he's found these, you know, different trajectories. So there's some people start off with a lot of traumatic symptoms and uh, stay and have those symptoms over time. Um, you know, other people, you know, have symptoms like, you know, right after they're pretty much in shock, but their natural trajectory is to go back to baseline to back to where they were. And so six months later, most everybody, the, the most of the trajectories are back to normal without any sort of intervention, without any sort of, uh, you know, treatment. And I think, you know, as the field of psychology thinks, oh, we need to talk about this and to work on it. There's actually a type of treatment that, you know, this is quick response type that has actually been kind of thought to be harmful and that we're actually exacerbating the problem by letting people know that, hey, we think you might have a problem and therefore maybe it becomes a problem because we're talking about it as mm. if, whereas he says, if we just leave the natural process, most people have a psychological immune system that fixes the, you know, sort of brings us back to where we were. Um, kind of continuing that line, like there's a whole field of affective forecasting and predicting how we'll feel. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so if we were talking about winning the lottery, like if you tell me, you know, what, how am I going to feel after winning the lottery uh, tomorrow morning? I'm going to be like so excited. I'm going to I don't know what I'm going to do. Buy new kettlebells, buy yeah. do something <laughs> fun. Like I'm planning out everything. I'm going to buy a gym just for yeah. myself. I, I don't know exactly, but I, I'm happy. If you ask me, how am I going to be six months later? I'm, I'm like still thinking I'm going to be that elated. Right you know, uh, going to my kettlebell gym that um, yeah. I built and all of these things, like my life is going to be awesome forever. And then, um, but in actuality, our happiness has this, you know, sort of set thermometer where we come back to where we were. So lottery winners six months later are back to their same level of happiness that they were right before they won the lottery. Um, mm. Same thing happens with people who have a, a traumatic injury and, you know, uh, might become paralyzed, for example. Um, they imagine they're going to be devastated. Their life is going to be devastated. They're going to be devastated forever. But again, they're back to, you know, when they've, you know, I'm sure there's a process involved with the rehabilitation, but once their rehabilitation is set, six months later, their happiness level is the same level it was before they started. So we've got this sort of set point of happiness, a set point um, and we have these immune system, these these recovery processes mm -hmm. built in. Um, so I think part of what we were talking about mm -hmm. is this idea of just getting back to where we were. And we're very good at recovery and these natural type of processes. That's interesting. You said the psychological immune system on that. That's not something I've heard you know much before, but it's so as it seemed that it might be harmful because we're not letting that immune system really take place. So it's almost kind of like keeping an open wound open if we talk too much about it and it could just dive into, it's, it's an interesting concept because we're right now, especially like, I think there was a research that came out that 30 years ago, if you asked the average 20 year old, if they would go into therapy, I think like 14% said that they would. Now it's like over 90% say they mm -hmm. are either are in therapy or comfortable going to therapy, which again, I, I think is a very good thing. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it's like, I think, do we kind of almost exacerbate some of these things that are going on? And sometimes it might just take a little bit more time to just recover from a psychological injury. Yeah. And I, yeah, that, so I thank you for clarifying that. And I didn't want to say that we don't need to do therapy <laughs> ever, but um, I do think we underestimate our, our natural process for recovery. Um, you know, in therapy, I've had people that, you know, get almost dependent on treatment. And, you know, I, I've, I've never did this, but I think theoretically about it. And I've talked to people about it, like kicking them out of therapy. Like, and when I talk to people about it, it's like, you know, you know, you're where you're at now is this much better. And I quantify everything with them. Um, you're at a place right now where you wouldn't be diagnosed with any sort of disorder. There are things we can always work on, but I want you to make a decision if you want to continue therapy because you want to work on these things or because you think you're broken still. And I think that's an important component is um, we don't want to give the message that people are broken and that they need this. We want to give the message, you know, like it's, a, um, you know, it's not rehabilitation. It's, you know, 
building a, a better system. Um, and so I, I think that's really important. And I don't want to, you know, say that everybody needs to just bottle up their feelings. That's not what I'm saying at all. Right. Um, I, I think we're just better at dealing with things um, if we just let that process go. Right. Well, it is. I mean, especially with something that's so fresh, right? It's like you, you know, I mean, everybody can go back to the first time they broke up with their boyfriend or their girlfriend. It's like, you think the world just ended and it's like, nothing is ever going to come back. And then slowly, but surely things pass on and you move. Like you didn't mm-hmm. need to go into a million different things of, uh, of going. It seems like it's almost a, there's a failure to launch aspect of it, of getting into that, where maybe it was exactly what you need at that time. But eventually, like you said, if you keep going back and thinking that you're broken, then almost turns into an enabling then where if you're relying on somebody all the time, yeah, I had a lot of conversations with people about even coaching with this, where if you're just going to your personal trainer a couple times or a few times a week, and you're just, you know, tuning out at that time, and that's all you get, yeah, you might get right off the bat some very good results, but eventually you might need to do more. You might need to think more on your own to get to that next level because you're not the same person that you were when you first walked in the door and met your personal trainer. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, I completely agree. I I see when I see the old style trainers putting the weights on for the person and um, you, you know, I want to teach them why they're doing what they're doing and uh, teach them their, to be their own trainer. I I mean, I think that's, that's, what's important, but um, yeah. The, the failure to launch piece, um, like I kind of want to touch on that a little bit. Sure. I wonder if it's that or if we're resistant to feel negative emotions. I think, you know, we've talked about you know, these type of ideas before. We want to be comfortable. We want to be happy. And embracing negative emotions, maybe that's part of it is we don't think we can cope with this sort of negative emotions unless we have somebody else to cope with. Um, and, you know, the you, you've on your podcast and, and different things you've cried. And, you know, I, I think that ability to feel comfortable being uncomfortable psychologically, yeah. being sad, um, feeling embarrassed, feeling vulnerable is just as a, important of a skill and very courageous. I and mean, I think it's really falls under that banner of courage. Um, and, you know, I think that's just as important if, if you're resisting that natural process and trying to fight those feelings, that's probably when you're going to, you know, cause greater injury. And I feel like I'm talking about the physical system, but it's, it's almost the same thing. If I'm resistant to feeling sad about something, um, you know, I, not going to deal with it probably as well. I need to just like, uh, I've heard this, uh, before you cry like a baby and then you get over it and babies, you know, just are known for mm-hmm. crying. And then all of a sudden they're just happy again. And, and I yeah. think that's, you know, that's something, you know, it's babies different cognitively, but mm-hmm. I, I think we could cry like babies more often and, and right. not deal with things, you know, long-term as much. Right. Yeah. So it's like, you can, put all those emotions out there, but then don't have to wallow in it and just be in that for the rest of the day. You can do that, get that release and then move on from there. Mm-hmm. It's, it reminds me, there was a, there was a great um, piece in one of my favorite books, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Um, I've, I've read it numerous times. I think I've recommended it a few times on the podcast, but in this, I remember there was a gentleman who owned a restaurant in it. And it's, it's a very deep book on spirituality and being in the now. And I remember this guy, he, he, you know, cooked this beautiful food. It was great presentation. Um, but then there was a fire at the restaurant and the main character, Dan is looking at him and he sees him in the fire and he's just looking. And this guy, he said, just let out this bellowing, just scream like of rage. He said, I felt rage, anger, sadness, like everything. All of, And then all of a sudden he just stopped, kind of collected himself and then turned over and said, Oh, Hey Dan, like, how are you? And then just kind of moved off from it. And Yep. There's a great passage in of like, how can you be? It's like, yeah, I, I got it out and now I'm, I'm moving on. Mm-hmm. That's that happened then. And now I'm going to move forward. That's that's exactly where I got the cry, cry like a baby from. So I, I stole it from that book. So you, I, I forgot that story, but yeah, you know, you explained it perfectly. Yeah, that's that's exactly where I found that. It, it's a great it was book. one of, really one of my book. main issues with the movie when it came out because they didn't put that scene in the movie. And I was like, mm. that's such a beautiful, perfect scene of you don't need everything to just in, you know encompass you an umbrella and put, be an umbrella over you. It's like you can feel everything all within one time and. It is. I'm, I mean, the 
the, what you mentioned about not embracing the negative emotions, um, you know, I've done a lot of work with shadow work and kind of going into that side of it and journaling and things. And in a lot of that, we talk about embracing that side of actually mm -hmm. saying, what are, what are the things that you feel good about those negative emotions? And it's mm -hmm. something we don't talk about a lot. Um, I think it was Jen Sincero in her book who said like, what do you enjoy about your vices? And it's like, nobody talks about why they, you know, indulge in the ice cream and stuff like that afterwards. It's like, it's just a bad thing. And I did another bad thing. And mm -hmm. she kind of said, it's like, well, what do you love about it? Like, why are you doing that? And it's like, well, it makes me feel good. It takes the edge off. It's kind of the ceremony at the end. And I think she did this in a way so you can get that same feeling from something else more positive, kind of put something in that mode of it. But a lot of times we don't think of that, I think, with the, with the negative side of it. We think that it's going to overcome us and we're not going to be able to get out of it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I, I think that's those are really great examples you gave. Um, yeah, we we don't know we can handle it, and I think that's part of. Um, we talked about this on last one or maybe two podcasts ago, mm -hmm. but like letting I told you the story about myself letting myself cry, yeah. watching the movie Rocky, and just you know like I was young. I learned not to cry. I learned that it wasn't an okay thing to do to cry, and I like thought I got to get past this and just. Let me, he's crying out for Adrian at the end and the, the probably the dumbest thing to cry to, but that's <laughs> what worked for me. And like, now I can let out my emotions and I feel more comfortable with it. So it might not be that you can be like that person in, in the peaceful warrior where you do let it all out, but we might have to practice and get to that stage. Just like we're not going to lift, you know, 500 pound deadlift um, tomorrow, but we have, we can make progress towards it. I think that that shadow work things that you're doing, um, you know, kind of, embracing it little by little. I'm still working on it, uh, still trying to, you know, let myself be vulnerable in places I'm not comfortable with. Yeah. Are there things that you found either personally in practice or from research that you've seen about embracing these negative emotions in the best practice? Is it, is there, is meditation the best way or is it another thing? Have you found specific things that work so we can not let it overcome us and, you know, be, really kind of embrace all different emotions together? Yeah, I think the meditation piece is great. I, um, you know, I think that can be hard for some people to, because it's got to be a practice and just like with anything else, you got to put the time and effort in. So I, I think that's great. It's sometimes too much practice for, for some people to add to their lives, but it's, it, I think the benefits outweigh the cost. Um, the, the one thing that I do, and we talk about this with anxiety disorders is, kind of just put yourself in those situations little by little. If, mm. if I've got somebody with social anxiety, I won't put them in the highest stress situation all at once. But when we're in those situations, we're changing the physiology of our body. We're changing the way we react to it. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the process of embracing, um, changes changes that uh, mm -hmm. let me give i'm sorry let me explain it a little bit better sure. um with an example so with panic disorder we do all these different exposures we have people you know breathe through a straw because they're um they have fear of bodily sensations of not being able to breathe or choking and um, we spin them in a chair to be dizzy we do all these different exposures to their bodily sensations i haven't felt panic and i really wanted to feel what people are feeling so we would also go to hot yoga. And I remember going to hot yoga, getting really warm, sweaty. I think I took caffeine beforehand, so my heart would be racing. And I remember getting up from a pose and feeling a little dizzy and feeling a, a little anxiety. And I, I said to myself, oh my gosh, I'm having a panic attack. Like, I'm so excited I'm having a panic attack. <laughs> and, and I killed it. Like, um, but like that sort of embracing um, that, that feeling, mm -hmm. like I think, that changes the way, you know, it's almost like coming at a problem like this versus uh, closed in. So open arms versus, right. you know, kind of closed in, um, you know, the Happy Gilmore movie where he's taking baseballs to his chest and he says, oh, let me have another one. We don't need to do baseballs to the, to the <laughs> chest, but like that, that sort of like, let me have my feelings, I think also helps us because we're telling our body it's not something to be afraid of and we mm -hmm. can embrace sadness, anxiety, or, or other, other types of uh, fears. Yeah. yeah, it seems like the best practices for this type of work is 
physical work, like really into the physiology of it. Um, remember when I talked with Dr. Tiffany Jones and she's a mindset counselor for, you know, elite athletes, she's worked with elite individual athletes in CrossFit games and tennis, but also in team sports. And we were talking about the differences. And she said, it's like when you, when something's going on in the mind, you do, you get that physical response in the body. So before mm -hmm. you try and start tackling everything that's going on in the brain, cause there's so much shit that's going on here learn how to embrace it in the body. So I love the analogy of, of the happy Gilmore when he's taking those deep breaths beforehand steps in front of it. Like we see it as a comical movie, but as we're talking about here, like it is, you're getting a physical response to knowing when you do, when he gets hit in the, in the hockey rink, he's going to be able to absorb it and he's going to be able to keep his cool. Yeah. Yep. And then that emotional Body physiological peace, I think, is so important. Um, you know, we rely as intellectual beings, we rely on the cognitive system so much. And I, I've, you know, Plato talked about a charioteer and two horses. One is sort of the wild, um, uncontrolled one, and that's body. And the other one is, um, if I can remember this correctly, is disciplined and that's that's the the mind and the charioteer is the soul in in his analogy um i don't i don't know about a soul so i kind of liken it to um a horse riding through the grand canyon and riding on these small ledges and the person riding on the horse as the cognitive system and the horse as the emotions the horse has ridden in the Grand Canyon before knows all of the places to step you know knows what's dangerous what's not is a pretty good system. The, the person on top is scared and trying to steer the horse into the wall because it doesn't want to get close to the edge. Um, and so I think sometimes that cognitive system is trying to steer an emotional system that's very adapted mm -hmm. to our environments. And you know, most animals have emotion systems that respond, know when danger is, know you know how to respond. And um our rider is a newer system it's a new newer evolutionary type of system and yeah. it's almost like a bait version there's a lot of uh, flaws with our cognitive systems um mm -hmm. not saying that cognitive can't influence emotions but it's hard to steer the horse you're never going to steer the horse over the ledge yeah. um, in the grand canyon analogy that's a beautiful analogy i i remember it's, I think it brings up the movie Avatar. I think James Cameron bumped on that. Like when the Avatar, they jump on top of whatever animal it was and their braid connects with theirs. And all of a sudden now they're you know, mutually together in the ride. And I remember it was such mm. a beautiful part in that when he like finally gets it and just it's that wash away type feeling, like all the anxiety that he was gonna be flying 30,000 feet up in the air, all of a sudden just washed away because he was letting go to the rider, like he mm -hmm. trusted it. It's kind of the same analogy that we're, you know, putting in here. Yeah. You know, there's the, there's the thing Jonathan Haidt put on there, the same thing with the rider on the elephant. And it's like the emotion. And it's like, we think that the rider is in control, but the horse or the elephant, whatever it is, it's going to go wherever the hell that it wants to from there. So that term that is, it's always challenging. And I've, I've cha had a challenge with this myself and um, I'm sure other people have too, is just kind of that term of surrendering to it. Like we don't like that term surrender or just open and be willing from there. But it seems like just allowing ourselves to just be in this moment, just let these things take over. This is the thing that this plus time, this is the way to embrace all of these things together. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the word surrender, like you said, is a tough one. Maybe it's just courageous to kind of let go um, and to kind of trust that process. Um, another, I, and I wish I knew where I found this, but, um, you know, it, it, it's like an acceptance type of idea. Like if you need to drink water from a river, you'll cup your hands. It's sort of, they've got enough tension, the water stays, um, but not too much. Like if you were to squeeze too much, you squeeze the water out. If your hands don't have any tension, the water just runs off your hands. And it's that, that right amount of tension in your hands to create a cup that allows you to drink that water. So I, I think I kind of liken it to that. Like we can have some control, but we have to also give up enough where you know, we're, we're to loose in, in, in the moment. Right. And that, that kind of moves right into the physical side with irradiation and training where it's creating that tension in the body where it's like you create enough tension, but the lift is the high priority. That's the first thing. So it's create the tension to, you know, 
you know, accelerate through the technique, but the lift is the number one thing. That was something that was so tough for me in training for a long time to think, because when you first get into especially hard style training, like you think like you need to snap everything so tight and everything needs to be so rock solid, but it's like, no, as soon as you get into the lift, you need to let it flow a little bit more. And I think Annalisa actually called me out on this in SFL because I was like, you know, in SFL training, where you're training a lot on empty bars to get this in. Mm-hmm. And I was like so tense on one of them <laughs> that I had veins popping out of my head. From it's just like breathe. It's like, oh mm-hmm. yeah, breathe. Let it go from there. You have enough tension with it. So it seems yeah. like it has a very, you know, same correlation into the physical side of training. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, I like that analogy. Um, you know, I, I think like throwing a punch is perfect. Uh, like uh, not, not throwing a punch itself, but the perfect, you know, uh, descriptor of that, like it's, it's a tension where you're kind of, it's throwing a punch. You're not, you know, it's not a bench press where you're struggling through the weight the whole time you have to be tight and loose. And I, I think that's, I, I mean, we can get into the physiology of muscles, but you need enough ATP to actually release the muscles quickly. And that's what elite athletes have. They can tense and relax very quickly. Yes. And that sort of turning it on and off. And, um, you know, I think of a mechanical example, a trebuchet that, you know, uh, shoots rocks, like there's a very loose rope and it drags and then it, like it creates enough tension. And at the last minute it releases that tension and, and it throws a, a rock or stone in the far distance. Like it's mm-hmm. the same thing, you know, any type of throw that we make, you know, it's the tension and then release of tension and, you know, attention again um, at the right times um, yeah. to guide, to guide things. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize a lot of that before. And then I worked with a young baseball player who's a pitcher and he introduced me to, uh, do you ever hear a driveline baseball? I haven't. They do this interesting thing with pitching mechanics where they focused on the C. So it's like when you step and you drive, it almost looks like the pitchers like hyper extending their kneecap back. So they Mm -hmm. kind of drive through the floor, which snaps into the hip, which releases into that slingshot motion. So when they release the ball, it looks like it has that perfect C shape. And, you know, Trevor Bauer for, I forget his, you know, uh, what team he's on now, but he was kind of one of the first big ones that I saw. And it, huh. it was all that kind of very fluid, very easy. Then all of a sudden in one motion, everything just snapped together. That's why you can throw 98 miles an hour when you're 5'11", 175 pounds and go into yeah. it. So it seems like the same thing. That's always an interesting thing when we talk about elite athletes, right? It's not a, like just their freakish strength or athleticism. You said it's that ability to tense and recover super fast in between everything you know you see that with yeah. sprint boxing but then it goes all the way into something like baseball as well so it's really not like one sport versus another that's really the you know elite athletics if you want to do that this is the modalities that you need to work with yeah yep and, and i think from a physiological standpoint this is what i find the body so amazing we need ATP. We think of ATP, the currency of energy, like that's what we need in our muscles to contract. And we've heard that over and over again. ATP is also what helps the cal- the calcium pump reabsorb the calcium, so we can relax. So you you know, and, and as you get fatigued, your body starts tensing. You become less um, you know less nimble, like uh, uncoordinated, because your body can't relax. Um, so you know sometimes you've lifted so much, like you're just so tense you can't even move, and yeah. that's um, you're lacking ATP. So ATPs, like I love that idea that you need ATP to relax, and even on that level, like we're you know still we we need energy to relax. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's just ironic. Yeah. It, it's interesting because I remember just going back to how I felt throughout this whole training with barbell. And I mean, straight up, I'm just, I haven't really worked with a barbell for many, many years before this, except for maybe some deadlifts that we did because I didn't have a squat rack for a long time. But then all of a sudden I was in a program for, you know, three, four months straight when it was all barbell work, which is high tension, low reps, and like you felt strong, but it's a mm-hmm. different type of feeling strong. It's not a I guess the best term is you don't feel that same athleticism from it because it's so high tension from there. So getting Mm -hmm. back into just even a little bit of ballistic work along with that, I think that's why the combination of both of those together is so good. And sometimes obviously it's important to maybe focus on one modality if there's a specific, you know, skill or a program or a challenge that you're doing, but in combination of just overall longevity and good health of everything, 
dabbling into a little bit at all different times, mm-hmm. I still think that might be the right recipe. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, and it, I mean, it's, it's Pavel's genius, but I, I think all of those programs together, bringing in the, the, the gymnastics piece, the body weight stuff, um, you know, that's teaching you to generate the tension in the core, which is like, I felt like I learned the most at the, the body weight because like it helped me. I went home immediately could squat a lot more weight. I could immediately, you know, do better kettlebell swings because I could generate energy from that, that core and, and sort of, um, you know, I, I just really liked that, um, that type of training too. Yeah. Yeah. The body weight training is very different. Like I, like I was sore after SFL. I took a few days off, but nothing like it was when we got immersed into high tension body weight training. Like I felt like I had the flu for three days after that from like body <laughs> aches of it. So, yeah. and I mean, and it, it did, it, it benefited so much in everything else that I was doing, but it's a, it's an immersion of high tension mm-hmm. work. So had much more respect for gymnasts after that, of being able yeah. to create all that tension for so, such long periods of time. I, and just a silly story, but I remember the, um, we were working on ab stuff uh, all morning or as Pavel calls it, Abby's um, all morning. And we had a little lunch and afterwards uh, I was called up to demonstrate something and I started cramping and I was like holding like a L sit type of position. And I'm like demonstrating, I can't like stop and like relax my cramp. So I'm like, if I rip an ab off, I'm like, I'll be proud of that forever. And I just remember being like tensing, tensing, tensing. And I just kind of gave into the cramp over time, but like it was, um, yeah, it was kind of an interesting, but yeah, you, I was so sore after that. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah, well, when you're in front of everybody and Pavel's looking at you, you can do different things that you never thought possible to hold, yes. I'm sure. Yeah. So with the, um, I mean, getting back into the, the psychological stress, from this is something I've always been curious about because there was a message going off that I don't know if I fully agree with or not. I'd love to get your take on it of like the gym is, is like therapy. Like, and for a while I was like, like, no therapy is therapy. And then, but as we're talking here too, I think like there is a a benefit to that physical demand and putting your body into some physical demands for the mental and the psychological stand. I I don't think I'm, you know, breaking news with that at all, but do you think, is there still kind of that right dose of using the gym and physical training for that psychological stress is a kind of a combination of doing your work in the gym and also maybe doing something like therapy or other kind of specific practices for mindset? Yeah, I, I think I, going back to your statement, the yeah. therapy is for therapy. I, I agree with that. I think therapy is important. Um, the other piece of, sorry, let me silence this real quick. Um, The, the other piece of this, that the physical is also just as important to our psychological system. There's a cognitive behavioral treatment for depression. Um, there was a dismantling study years ago where they looked at what are the most important components. So they had one group that got just cognitive therapy, one group that got just behavioral activation, and a third group that got uh, the full treatment. So behavioral activation was just go do things um, some of them were physical. Some of them were like mastery type things, like getting a load of laundry done or doing something, mm-hmm. um, you know, wherever the person is at that's depressed. Um, and then, you know, some other things like doing fun things. The behavioral activation worked just as well as the full treatment. And I, I think that, um, you know, I sometimes go a little bit against the cognitive work because I just see how important the physical, the behavioral t- yeah. type things are. Acting as if you're not depressed doing physical activities goes a heck of a long ways. And I think as the field of psychology sometimes thinks so much about cognitions and how can we can talk people. Um, and I think we forget about the body and the physical piece. And that, that's why I've always like, you know, why I've gotten so involved in strong first and other sort of exercise type things. My research has always been on, you know, the combining of these two type things. I think they're both important and f- mm-hmm. important for different people in different ways. We did a, a study with social anxiety and we had one group just do a simple and sinister protocol for, um, and they were in the wait list for the, the social anxiety group, 
but they showed great improvement just doing simple administer. Wow. And I don't know what the mechanism is, but I think something happened to them physiologically from, you know, doing some sort of exercise protocol. So I think there's a lot to it that we might not have explored as, as much as other types of treatment. Yeah. Do you think that's because like effort feels good? Like, and when you combine it with something that's challenging and then you push it through, I mean, that's the, I mean, that's the main thing of, of dopamine, right? It's like we, mm -hmm. I was listening to this with Andrew Huberman, and I'm going to completely probably butcher it. Um, but he talked about we we think of dopamine as like the pleasure, you know, uh, response from it. When it's like it's not pleasure, it's like it's it's the chemical of drive, where it's like it feels that motivation. It makes motivation and effort feel good. So, do you think there's maybe something to those people who are waiting on the trial, just getting into some swings and getups in a simple sinister trial? Now all of a sudden they're taxing their body and they're feeling some effort and seeing mm -hmm. the fruits of it. Cause I could even see that from doing a load of laundry, right? It's like, if you're doing something physical and now all of a sudden you see that you just put your laundry away and just mm -hmm. doing some stuff, it kind of feels good. So maybe it's just rewiring our brains into letting the effort that we're doing actually feel good, feel like we're accomplishing something. I completely agree. I, I have a to-do list and sometimes I've already done the item just feels good to put it on the list and then cross it out, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so that I, I completely agree that I think that mastery people, you know, the people with social anxiety in the group, we're not getting a lot of mastery from their life in, you know, other areas. So mm -hmm. maybe, you know, that's why the gym is my therapy, you know, is, is kind of popular because it's a place you can get some mastery where maybe you're not feeling it in other parts of your life. And I think that dopamine pathway makes a lot of sense of, you know, one of those mechanisms. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I was that guy for so long of the crossing stuff off the to-do list. And it's like, if it was mm -hmm. on this the, the list, I was getting it done because it felt so good, but it was almost like a badge of honor of getting in mm -hmm. it. But then I, I realized one day that I was like crossing stuff on and I could not remember a single thing of actually what I did. It's like, I, mm -hmm. you know, did some reach outs or I had to do a bunch of emails and stuff, but I couldn't remember anything. So it was like, I think a lot of times we're trying to find the universal approach to what's the best thing when in reality, it's like, it could change at any different time. Like, you know, fission training might be perfect for you, you know, right now, but then all of a sudden you need to throw in some fusion and maybe it's a combination of both of them together. Um, so this is, this is why I've, I've gotten so deep with Brett on like some of the intuitive training side of it. Cause for a while, I was such that guy of just the structure down and almost using mm -hmm. physical training as the way to tap into the psychological things that I wanted to work with, but it wasn't mm -hmm. working anymore. Like it worked for a period of time, but then I had to shift it and do something different. And I think that's just naturally where we're at, right? It's like, if you're not doing physical training, you might get a really great psychological benefit from it up to a certain point, then maybe you have to try something different and keep, you know, switching it up. Definitely. Yeah. I think you've kind of pointed out a couple of things. There's inter inter individual differences where, you know, you and I are different. We need different training methods. I think we overlook that a lot, but we definitely overlook intra individual differences. And that, that idea of, you know, simple and sinister was awesome for me, you know, at a certain time in my life. Um, the quick and dead style protocols were great for me. You know, now I need something different. And like, you know, it's, it's, it's different times. Um, I like Brett's idea of, you know, intuitive training and, and those type of things as well. So yeah, it's, it's those intra individual, we need, we think we figured ourselves out and then we have to adjust again. So um, we're tricky people. <laughs> we are, we are definitely tricky people. So so after you get this dunk, uh, after you get this dunk challenge done, okay, what's next? Do you have an idea of what you're going to focus on next as far as training plans? Um, I've been enjoying, you know, like I, I know you've done some different like body composition and stuff, and I'm kind of surprised how well my body composition is right now. And it's, it's, it's not, it's a byproduct of all these other challenges. And um, so I'm kind of thinking about, uh, you know, I, I was going to do some, you know, endurance type things and try to do some, some random things, um, you know, like a Spartan challenge or, or something mm -hmm. along those lines, but um, I'll focus on the dunk challenge for now and then figure it out. In, I'll, I'll follow Brett's method, follow it intuitively, see what happens next. There you go. Yeah. It's uh, the intuitive stuff is interesting because it's really the 
way that I found so much of doing the same thing every day without doing the same thing every day. Um, so it's, if you don't have a specific goal down, I've recommended it to a million, you know, million different people because it's, it's very enjoyable and, uh, and works very well in there, but it is the body, the body comp stuff. That's a whole nother thing that we'll probably get into the next podcast in there. Cause <laughs> I've, I've done different like cuts before with nutrition the same type of macro breakdowns, tame different spreads, fasting, all that type of stuff, and made everything even and got completely different results from one year after the another. And it's one of the weirdest and most frustrating things sometimes when it's like, this worked like last year, like in a month. And now mm -hmm. it's taking like four to get the same type of stuff. It is, it's one of the weirdest things. It's, it's, you know, the butterfly effect of, you know, chaos theory of just, changing one variable. I mean, I think of gut bacteria. I look at a lot of gut bacteria stuff and I know nothing. And, but like, you know, just your diet, you know, they've talked about it like vegetarians eating one meal with meat and how all of a sudden their gut microbiome changes. And that's so important to how we, you know, absorb carbohydrates and proteins and, you know, just those little things, you know, where we're starting, what little butterfly effect we have, you know, and, and change in the system that, you know, we're not the same person gut microbiome piece, you know, than we were. And I'm not saying it's the gut microbiome, but there's just so many of those little components that play a role. And it's, it's, it is, it is chaos. It's, uh, um, you know, there's one thing makes a huge difference, you know, 10 repeats down the road. So. Yeah. It is one of the, I, I have like given up trying to figure out exactly what it is because there's like, it's so interpersonal, like of nutrition. It's like one of those, like we can talk about physical training and there's different modalities that we can work with. And most of them are going to work for the majority of people if they're good programs out there, or you can go into intuition, all that type of good stuff. But nutrition is like from one person to the another, I was like, what? Like they're on the exact same thing. They're the same person, same age, mm -hmm. same physical ability. They get completely different results from it. It's the weirdest shit I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. It is. It is very. And, and I, I, the people who are heavily involved in it, like I'm thinking of Dom DiAgostino and, you know, kind of keto diets yeah. and, you know, the questions he gets over and over and over again. And it's, you know, it's, 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 everybody has like a slightly different response to it and these different things. And, um, you know, it's the person that's variable. It's not the, the diet as much as the, the person. So it's, yeah, it's fascinating to me. Yeah. I wonder on that side too, if it's just, same thing like we were talking about on the psychological side it just takes time you know it's like where i mean nutrition probably more than anything we want to work we want it to work immediately we want to see the results right away in six weeks or 12 weeks when sometimes it might take much longer down the road that's why i i follow uh, lane norton a lot because i love his because he just calls bullshit out on a lot of just the quick acting type stuff and actually yeah. gets into the science behind you know, what's going on. And he's, he's, he's hysterical to listen to too, but um, that's another thing. So, yeah, I mean, I think the, the psychological immune system, I think was such a huge takeaway on that. I hope more people listen to that and understand that. Cause it's like, if you feel like you need to get in and work on that great, but sometimes just giving it a little time, let it marinate and just kind of, you know, let it, let it happen. It might just resolve itself on its own. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think giving ourselves, credit when it's due, but also giving us ourselves like uh, the ability to forgive ourselves. Like, you know, if we're feeling bad, it's a normal human process. It's not, uh, you know, and, and it's adaptive in many ways, you know, feeling down helps us see the world differently. It helps us solve problems differently. It's, it's okay to feel down. Um, you know, if you're feeling down, you know, the diagnosis of depression is not feeling down. It's feeling down for most of the time for at least two weeks. And so then, you know, maybe then it's more of a problem, but hey, if you're down for a day, listen to some sad music, you'll see life from a different perspective. If you're up one day, you know, enjoy the, the high, but you don't have to keep, you know, driving for one versus the other. It's, you know, kind of that intuitive, intuitive psychological system, maybe where you know, just we're on the, the horse and we're going to just let it ride to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's beautiful. It is. It's the, that pendulum of kind of like up and down is, is more normal than we think we don't like it, but you get those high days, then all of a sudden it might follow by a low day. Cause you don't go back to normal. It usually swings a little bit lower. So it's finds that balance in there. So um, no, it is, it's uh, 
this is just all important stuff. Craig, I think we did another successful one here. I think this was great. So I, I can't believe I have anything to say. I, I think <laughs> I've repeated myself so many times, but I, I always love talking to you. You bring the best out of me. So thank you very much. I appreciate and uh, and likewise, ditto on the same front. I appreciate it. And um, I'm sure we'll be getting together again soon. There's a lot more that we'll dive into in here. So uh, Breaking Muscle, you got a lot of articles out there um, for people to take a look at. So you can go check those out. Um, anything else, uh, any other places that we can send listeners to check out some more of the work that you're doing? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I'll have a strong first article up pretty soon on um, kind of looking at um, the quick and the dead type protocols or A plus A mm -hmm. protocols and how to, to measure those and kind of, kind of look at your progress on those. So that should be up pretty soon. Too. Love it. Perfect. Craig, thank you so much, man. Great to see you. And uh, great to see you this again too. Listeners, thank you so much. I'll catch you on the next one. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you found some great value here. And if you like this episode, please drop a comment and leave us a five-star rating and review. It does more to build the show than you can imagine. And do not forget to check out and join the Strength Connection Facebook group. In this group, I share the biggest takeaways and lessons from these amazing conversations, as well as training and strength tips for pursuing mastery and fulfillment in life. If so this group is filled with individuals looking to take full control over their strength and it's the perfect space to explore new ideas and to share your journey. And you'll also get exclusive access to the Strength Connection Mastery Seminars. It's a deep dive into the physical, mental, and spiritual training that you can begin using immediately. So do not wait. Go now. Seriously, go. I right, much love to you. Thank you so much and I'll catch you on the next one.